I do not have many regrets in life, but one I do have is not opening that box up sooner. Whenever someone dies in Morton, we have a rather odd little tradition. The family of the deceased donates to the Heritage Centre a small shoebox-sized container that acts as a record of that person's life, their contributions to the town, their loves, interests and achievements. These boxes range in shape and material and usually contain tiny keepsakes, objects, news cuttings and bits of memorabilia that would allow a historian such as myself to open it up and gain some insight into a life lived. It also means that there is a constant repository and years from now a grandson or even great-grandson could pop into the Heritage Centre and ask to see the box filled with trinkets that once belonged to their long-departed relative. This tradition, which started centuries ago when the boxes were stored at the church and were initially only for noblemen and dignitaries, has become quite the talking point for people outside of the village. And as a curator, I get many requests from people interested in digging out a specific box as well as from others who just want to see the rows and rows of boxes all lined up together. Part of my job as the custodian of the Heritage Centre is to sift through these boxes taking out and cataloguing things that might be of wider interest or of greater historical significance than the donating family initially realised. In all honesty, the contents of most boxes are somewhat mundane and unremarkable for anyone not directly connected to the deceased, but sometimes it has wider implications. Grandad's winning goal in the local derby football match 60 years ago might be a great family story, but is also important for filling in the gaps in the local sports records, for example. Of course, there are also the other boxes, the ones that do contain exceptional things. Sometimes they are strange objects that lead to a story, but all too often they are confessions, diaries, affidavits, and sometimes just notes or letters in sealed envelopes that the dying ask to be put in their box, with the caveat that it should not be opened until a stated number of years after their death. This process, whereby an elderly or terminally ill member of the community will confront death by scribbling down a list of truths they did not want to be known during their lifetimes has added another, darker streak to this process. In some ways, it's a good thing. For those who do not have faith, it's a way for them to get things off their chest, allowing them to their grave knowing that at least in some way the secrets and burdens they have carried with them for years will be lifted. In other ways, it is a bad thing because on at least three occasions people have confessed to crimes crimes that they will never be punished for, at least in this life. Opening those kinds of boxes becomes a burden in itself. You need to decide what to do with the information once you receive it. You might know that someone's granny was having an affair with the parish priest all along, but do you want that information spread when it will hurt so many people? You might learn of a crime committed 50 years ago. Do you go to the police and tell them so they can exhume bodies and prove the facts? Or do you accept that in this case the truth will hurt more people than it will help? With the perpetrator beyond justice and the relatives and friends of the victim either dead or moved away, is it a more merciful thing to allow some sleeping dogs to lie? With the box donated by William Mange, I wish I'd opened it whilst he was still alive and shared its contents with the world. But I didn't. Who exactly compiled these boxes varies from person to person, in many cases, the boxes are curated by the individuals themselves and then donated by the family after their death. In other cases, it was the families who placed the items into the box after their relative had passed on. In short, you never knew until you opened the box whether it had actually been put together by Joe Bloggs or by the family of Joe Bloggs. In William's case, there was no doubt. Unlike with most donations, William's box was not brought to the Heritage Centre by relatives, friends or neighbours but by William himself, possibly with good reason. It was simply a fact that nobody in Morton would have dared volunteer to bring William's box to be kept for posterity, nor would they have been happy to help to assist him in any way. William Minge, or Mange as some people in town referred to him, was for better or worse a pariah. Shunned by the community and isolated at his house behind Acres Wood on account of accusations that had been made about him many years before, According to the rumours, William Mange was the child eater. For years, all through the 60s and early 70s, William lived alone in his little house on the edge of Acres Wood. A recluse and an eccentric, he was considered by most to be strange, 
but essentially harmless. Mostly because he was never actually seen out of doors, out of sight, out of mind. For the local children, it was different. Mange, for whatever reason, became something of a childhood bogeyman. I remember my own father telling me that he and his pals would race along the dirt path that ran in front of Mange's place in the same way that they would pass old Ragbag the Scarecrow out by the chicken run. They ran because they were scared. The path itself was somewhat of an intimidating route, fringed as it was on one side by the woods and on the other by the ramshackle fence to William's garden. It was the thick web of folklore and myth hanging around the place that really made it scary. The stories themselves were ridiculous, so overblown that they took on an almost fairy tale like quality, which was of course reinforced by the gingerbread house in the woods appearance of William's old cottage. One story told of how old Mange had once offered a young boy some chocolate as he plodded along the path. The boy had accepted and ate the chocolate, after which he began, all at once, to feel woozy and tired. He had been drugged. When he came to, as the story goes, he was laying out flat on a table inside the cottage. As he started to come to his senses and pull around, he happened to look to his left and saw old Mange sitting by the side of the table. He had the boy's hand halfway into his mouth. He was happily eating his fingers. Through some miracle, never fully explained in the story, the boy managed to escape. By the time he got away, only the thumb remained on his left hand, the rest of the digits had been chewed off and devoured. Of course, nobody could ever point to who this boy was supposed to have been or explain why. If the story was true, old Mange had never been arrested. Still, far-fetched as the stories might have been, they were enough to make the kids sprint past Mange's house. By the time Tim Thompson went missing in 1985, it wasn't just the kids who were suspicious. Not that William did much to allay people's fears. In the winter of 1977, after a few kids had dared each other to throw stones at William's windows and had in fact broken one or two, there was suddenly a dramatic change in William's garden. In the dead centre, opposite his front door and close to where a small path led by Mangi's gate, he had installed an immense statue, a carving, two metres high, brightly coloured, and an almost exact miniature copy of another famous statue that stands in the town centre of the city of Bern. It was a statue of the Child Eater. A quick search on Google for the Child Eater of Bern will show you this hideous statue. A huge ogre with a gaping mouth and straight square teeth, stuffing a baby into his jaws as other children struggle to escape the sack in his hand. Other plump children, screaming in terror, are trapped, pinned under his belt. Why any town would erect such a monstrous figure in the centre I do not know. Nor do I know why William chose to erect this replica in his garden. Perhaps to play into the stories about him. Perhaps to scare away the children who were pestering and bothering him when all he wanted was to be left alone. Whatever the reason, the statue did not win him any popularity contests in the area with many residents complaining about the terrifying carving and asking William to remove it. He never did. In fact, mildewed, moss-covered and eroded by rain, the statue still stands in Mange's overgrown garden, and for as long as that statue remained, so too did the rumours. In 1981, a local lad by the name of David Peterson broke into William's cottage in the middle of the night. Unflustered by the stories, he had decided that anyone living out there away from everyone was probably hoarding something worth stealing. Having forced the window, he broke into William's kitchen. He was not there long. Around two hours after he had attempted the break-in, David Peterson turned himself in at Morton Police Station and confessed to what he had done. He said he was willing to take the charge of breaking and entering or even attempted burglary so long as the police went up to William's house and raided it. According to Peterson, when he had broken into the kitchen, he had seen a collection of notice boards hanging from the far wall on which were images cut from the local newspaper. Hundreds and hundreds of faces, some in black and white, some in colour, all of small boys. The police did not raid Mange's place, but of course, they did go up to visit since they knew that he had been broken into. Knocking on the front door, they got no answer, but they did eventually find William. He was standing in his back garden, barefooted and still in his pyjamas. 
Before him was a large metal litter bin in which he had decided to light a bonfire. At 4.25 a.m., when the police questioned him about what he was burning at such an early hour, William said, garden waste, there's no law against it. When they pointed out that it was somewhat unusual to be burning things in the garden in the middle of the night, William responded angrily, asking, How am I supposed to sleep when there's people trying to break in the window? I was woken up. I wouldn't be going back to sleep, so I thought I'd make a start on the next day's chores. Is that a crime? Of course it wasn't, and the police did not investigate any further. David Peterson was charged with criminal damage and forced to replace the broken window. There was no further investigation into William Mange. Until a month after he had died, when William donated his box to the Morton Heritage Centre, it came with a small padlock on the front. When I asked how I was supposed to open it, he replied that once he died, I could hit the lock with a hammer for all he cared. Just don't open it before I'm gone. A week later, William Mange was dead by his own hand. He had been suffering from terminal cancer and had decided not to continue on any further. A fortnight after that, during which time I considered several times forcing the lock on Mangi's box, a letter arrived for me. There was no note inside, just a small silver key. I'm not sure how, but I knew immediately which lock that key would fit. To this day, I do not know who sent the key. There was no note inside the box donated by William Mange either, but there were two photographs. One was of the statue. Not the one in William's garden, but the original in Bern. The other photo was of William. He was dressed in full medieval costume, in an outfit that was a perfect match for the child eaters. In his left hand, he held a huge hessian sack that from the way it bulged, seemed to be full. There was also something else. Carefully wrapped in a small velvet cloth were 26 tiny bones. Later, analysis revealed them to be the finger bones of children. Who those bones had once belonged to is unclear. What was not unclear was that every single one of them had been chewed.